I'm very um, privileged today to introduce Professor Richard Whitman. He is the Head of School and the Professor of Politics and International Relations at Kent University, Canterbury, and he's also the Director of, Global Euro of the Global Europe Centre. So thank you for being here. Uh, just so following on from our roundtable that we've just completed, just wondering, you know, and um, reflecting on your comments, do you think the referendum decision in June was the right one for the United Kingdom? Uh, I'm not sure whether it was the right decision for the UK in terms of the disruptive effects for the UK, because I think that's what it's done. Mm -hmm. uh, it's really called into question, you know, British politics, called into question, you know, the sort of future shape of the economy, future trading relationships, future diplomatic relationships. I mean, it's also called into question the future direction of a lot of domestic policy, for example, agricultural policy, mm. you leave the EU, you, you leave a kind of agricultural support system, for example. So it's opened up almost every aspect uh, of the UK's uh, public policy uh, to uh, potential change. Um, and that could be a good thing for the UK in the medium or long term because it gives it a chance to to start from first principles in some areas. But at the same time, it has a significant cost in terms of the kind of political bandwidth that's taken up, you know, working through uh, all of those issues. But it's also, I think, had a, a short-term effect in, in exposing a sort of cleavage in society, essentially between those who are uh, happy with the idea of the UK having a particular kind of identity, which is to be a member of the EU, mm -hmm. uh, and those who feel uncomfortable with that idea or and or see as it's some kind of restriction or constraint or worse, damaging to, to British national identity. and. You know, that kind of split between, you know, the 48% that voted to remain and the 52% who voted to leave um, is really now the sort of main fault line, I think, of British, British political life. And that has some implications for parties uh, uh, and what parties stand for, uh, as well as, you know, a lot of relationships that people have in terms of the workplace uh, and so on, because, um, you know, it's a defining issue for many people. And do you think then that the European Union was responsible for this cleavage in British society? I think, I think the, the European Union has played a part or has made a contribution to this cleavage, but I think it's been coming for a long time because in the first instance there's been this kind of uncertainty about what Englishness means. And I think if you look at the vote, you know, the English essentially voted differently from the other parts of the UK. I mean, you, you know, Wales voted to to leave, but essentially it was a vote by the English uh, to leave, and it was a vote by the English outside London to leave. Mm. Uh, and what's been developing across time, I think, is this um, split uh, in the constituent populations uh, of the UK between those who see their national identity or their local identity reinforced by EU membership uh, or given a chance to flourish as a consequence, and those who see it as being challenged. Mm -hmm. And I think for the English, as opposed to for the Scots, uh, the Welsh, uh, and for the Northern Irish, it's represented uh, a challenge. And, and in many ways, English nationalism, which wasn't really a phenomena, uh, has emerged as a kind of opposition to Brussels. Mm -hmm. And that, I think, provided the foundation for uh, leaving uh, leaving the EU and that UKIP is essentially an English political phenomena rather than you know having any uh, great success in in Scotland and Northern Ireland a, a bit in Wales again sort of reflecting the uh, the way that Wales voted but I think it's really thrown up uh, this sort of emerging or shifting identities within the UK but I think the EU bears a responsibility in the sense that you know appearing to be inflexible and appearing to be a sort of one-size-fits-all project. And I think that's it's the, the sort of essential English opposition as constraint that it was trying to make, um, you know, all European states feel identical. Mm -hmm. And, you know, differentiation weighs small and large 
uh, was being challenged by, you know, the desire by Brussels, as it was seen, to to seek uniformity, which means interfering as a, as opponents to you, you would see in the kind of nooks and crannies of people's life, you know, determining what kind of light bulbs you could buy, or you know, all these kind of small decisions that that people thought were in some way an encroachment on their freedom. Yeah. And Theresa May gave a very important speech yesterday, UK time, I believe. Um, what what do you think will be the impact of that? Well, I think what it's done is it's 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 now provided a a prospectus really for what the UK wants um, or what the the current UK government wants uh, out of its future relationship with the EU. What we've lacked for over six months has really been a clear uh, understanding and a sort of prospectus for the uh, for the negotiations. And so in the gap or rather the silence that's existed, there's been a huge amount of speculation as to whether UK wants to be in the single market, whether it wants to be in the customs union and so on. And now what we've got uh, is clarity as to what the government wants, which is bottom line, it's willing to accept not very much. And so in a sense, the British government's negotiating position is we can live with making a very, very minimal deal. Anything we get on top of that is a bonus. And I think that will have slightly, uh, more than slightly wrong footed the other member states yeah. who have been holding the line and saying there is essentially something here that we're not going to negotiate on, which is the single market and the four freedoms. And the UK has now said, well, we accept that and we want something else, which is not something that you've been thinking about. So I think it does put the, the other member states on the back foot. Mm. Do you think, that, though, there will be more stability within the UK after this speech? People will sort of know more what's going to happen? I think that it will allow people to plan a bit more for the future. I mean, whether it's the future they want or not is another, another matter. And I don't think you will see any reduction in the activity of those that want to remain part of the European Union. I anticipate you'll have more legal challenges, you'll have more public demonstrations, there'll be attempts to use uh, by-elections as uh, opportunities to register a protest vote in terms of the UK leaving the EU. So I think all of those things will uh, continue, but it does mean that what Theresa May has done is she's essentially um, won over uh, the uh, Brexiteers in her party, those who wanted to, those who wanted to leave and campaign to leave, um, and reassured them that she is um, reliable and trustworthy on this issue, which means she hasn't got to spend time dealing with this kind of insurgency within her own party. And in fact, the insurgency she probably faces now is for those who want to remain and those who want to remain in the single market. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much for your time today. It's much appreciated.